All right, let's take a look at the genesis story of the materialist theory par excellence, evolutionary theory, in the form of Richard Dawkins' uh, landmark, The Selfish Gene. And we're going to read from uh, the end. It's a brief summary of, of the, um, the kind of the whole argument. It gives a lot of examples. Um, but I'm going to read here because it's a good little summary, and we're going to do a little close reading and, and uh, kind of see what happens here. So the term, um, so he says, let me end with a brief manifesto. A summary of the entire selfish gene extended phenotype view of life. So ultimately, the, this way of life is that um, genes are the ones that run the show, right? The phenotype, the term phenotype, the entomology is important here. The term phenotype is made up of pheno in Greek, which means to shimmer or to show. And the word type, which means a symbol or a pattern. So this showing up of a pattern is the phenotype. And the phenotype is just a body, an individual, a discerned uh, body with features, right, that shows. So phenotype. And there's the word gene, right? The root word of gene is, is genesis, is to generate, it, right? So the genes, the replicators, as he calls them here, is are the generator functions. And the phenotype, the body, is the um, what shows up and, um, and, and materializes as a material pattern, a body. So he says, let me end with a brief manifesto, a summary of the entire selfish gene extended phenotype point of view, view of life. It is a view I maintain that applies to living things everywhere in the universe. The fundamental unit, the prime mover of all life is the replicator. A replicator is anything in the universe of which copies are made. The replicator is anything in the universe of which copies are made. Replicators come into existence in the first place by chance, by a random jostling of smaller particles. Once a replicator has come into existence, it is capable of generating an indefinitely large set of copies of itself. No copying process is perfect, however, and the population of replicators comes to include varieties that differ from one another. Some of these varieties turn out to have lost the power of self-replication and their kind ceases to exist when themselves cease to exist. Others can still replicate, but less effectively. Yet other varieties happen to find themselves in possession of new tricks. They turn out to be even better self-replicators than their predecessors and contemporaries. It is their descendants that come to dominate the population. As time goes by, the world becomes filled with the most powerful and ingenious replicators. Gradually, more and more elaborate ways of being a good replicator are discovered. Replicators survive not only by virtue of their intrinsic properties, but by virtue of their con consequences on the world. Right? He's talking about genes here, the evolution of, of genes. Replicators are the genes. These consequences can be quite indirect. All that is necessary is that eventually the consequences, however torturous and indirect, feedback and affect the success of the replicator at getting itself copied. An obvious thought that comes here is the uh, Agent Smith in the Matrix, right? Replicator. Um, there's, it's a, uh, you can think of many kind of examples like that. You can think of something like a mind virus or mass formation psychosis. Um, because in, in terms of the, our current social media environment, the genes, the memes are the genes. They are what replicate and, and have an effect on the phenotype, the bodies or the collections of bodies that, that um, experience them. The success that a replicator has in the world will depend on what kind of world it is, the pre-existing conditions. Among the most important of these conditions will be other replicators and their consequences. Like the English and German rowers, replicators that are mutually beneficial will come to predominate in each other's presence. At some point in the evolution of life on our Earth, this ganging up of mutually compatible replicators began to be formalized in the creation of discrete vehicles. This was the first cell, or for as cells emerged, right? This, this falling into cooperation um, leveled up the organizing factor of these replicators into cells. So this was the, his theory of how cellular life um, emerged. 
and then many celled bodies. Vehicles that evolved a bottlenecked life cycle proposed uh, prospered and became more discreet and vehicle-like. This packaging of living material into discrete vehicles, bodies, became such a salient and dominant feature that when biologists arrived on the scene and started asking questions about life, their questions were mostly about vehicles, individual organisms. The individual organism came first in the biologist's consciousness, while the replicators, known as the genes, were seen as part of the machinery used by individual organisms. It requires a deliberate mental effort to turn biology the right way up again and remind ourselves that the replicators come first in importance as well as in history. There's so many different words I'd like to think of when we think of these replicators, right? They are the, uh, the, the principality, the low guy, right? The dark low guy in this case, right? That manifest themselves in patterns in people and bodies, not just people, right? Um, animals, plants, it's the whole root of this parasitic relationship between uh, bodies that is uh, explained in this theory here. One way to remind ourselves is to reflect that even today, not all the phenotypic effects of a gene are bound up in the individual body in which it is. So the genes, they don't just affect one individual phenotype, one body, right? The genes actually reach out and affect the world, other people. So my individual genes actually reach out into the world and affect other people. This is um, the process, uh, the mimetic process, the memes that we see in social media here. Certainly in principle, and also in fact, the gene reaches out through the individual body, the wall, and manipulates objects in the world outside. Some of them inanimate, some of them other living beings, some of them long away away. With only a little imagination, we can see the gene as sitting in the center of a radiating web of extended phenotypic power. Okay, we can see the gene, the generator function, the organizing principle as sitting at the center of a radiating web of extended phenotypic power, a power of extended uh, shimmering symbolic power of, of the showing up of material bodies. So material bodies are interspersed with a network of genes. And here, I mean, I'm sorry, let me read this again here. It says, with only a little imagination, can we see the gene as sitting at the center of a radiating web of extended phenotypic power? And an object in the world is the center of a converging web of influences from many genes sitting in many organisms. The long reach of the gene knows no obvious boundaries. The whole world is crisscrossed with the causal arrows, arrows joining genes to phenotypic effects far and near. I mean, it wouldn't be a stretch to think of the term principality with regards to genes. Um, in the body, the individual, as the phenotype, right? So it's a, it's a relationship between a principality, a generating function in the forms of, in the form of genes, um, and an individual body, a, that is affected by this process. So it's interesting thinking it from a, uh, powers and principalities perspective, right? Uh, that there are forces, right? The, like we can think of the passions, whatever it may be, there are forces, uh, difficult to describe, ineffable forces that affect every individual and collection of individuals in profound ways. And I think you can dis, you can you can draw that as a valid conclusion that Richard Dawkins is getting here with his theory, his theory of uh, the selfish gene and the effects it has evolutionarily on phenotypes, which is all types of bodies. Finally, it is an additional fact too important to practice to be called incidental, but not necessary enough in theory to be called inevitable, that these causal arrows have become bundled up. Replicators are no longer peppered freely through the sea. 
They are packaged in huge colonies, individual bodies. And phenotypic co consequences, instead of being evenly distributed throughout the world, have in many cases congealed into those same bodies. But the individual body, so familiar to us on this planet, did not have to exist. The only kind of entity that has to exist in order for life to arise anywhere in the universe, Dawkins says, is the immortal replicator. The immortal replicator. So, let me know what you guys think. Um, thanks for listening.